<laughs> now, praise God. You know, I really enjoy being able to offer that time to be able to fellowship real quick and meet each other. You know, I know it's hard right now that our fellowship hall is still down, and that is where we got to really connect with each other, whether it be over a meal, some snacks, some coffee. So it's important that we take this time during the service to be able to just welcome each other and say hello, amen, amen. because relationships in Christ is what we are called to do, right? We are called to connect with people. We are called to come alongside each other. None of us are meant to do anything in this world alone, amen? So for you, those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Joe. I am the Celebrate Recovery ministry leader along with my wife, Jennifer, here at New Hope Community Church on Tuesday evenings. If you don't know what Celebrate Recovery is, it is simply a 12-step uh, recovery program centered in Jesus Christ for people who have the desire to break free from strongholds in their life, not just from alcohol or drugs, to break free from strongholds, things that are holding you back for God's best for your life. People hear recovery, they hear 12 step, and they're like, well, I don't need that. I don't do drugs. I don't drink. Well, neither do 98% of the people that come here on Tuesdays. Amen. Amen. So I'm not very good on math, but that's a pretty high percentage of people who come to celebrate recovery that, that want to be free from their past. They want to be free from abandonment, um, resentment issues, people that have been rejected by people in their life, people that have struggled with pornography, people that struggle with codependency, people that struggle with drugs and alcohol as well, and tobacco and anger, and you name it. The list goes on because as much as we might not want to admit it, we all struggle in life with something. Amen. So if you'd like to learn more about Celebrate Recovery, please come and speak to me and my wife, Jennifer, um, after service, and we will gladly explain to you how we do things and, and really what we do here on a Tuesday night. But the one thing I love what we do here on a Tuesday night is we praise and we worship our King Amen. Jesus. We get loud in here. We turn this place up for King Jesus because it's all about him. It is not about me. It is not about nobody that comes here. It is all about Jesus. And one thing, Pastor Bruce, because I'm under Pastor Bruce's mentorship and I love Pastor Bruce. And how many have been excited this past 12 weeks about the Minor Prophets? You know, I gave, yeah, amen. I gave Pastor Bruce a little hard time. Like, I don't know, Pastor Bruce, that's, that's 12, 13 weeks of a series. That's a long series. But then I started listening and learning more about it. And man, I was really blessed to be able to hear each one of those messages and to learn so much about these minor prophets that we might not even open up the Bible to. So I'm really excited that. So under being under uh, Pastor Bruce's mentorship, um, I'm also going through the lead program for the Christian and Missionary Alliance, uh, which is a program that's three years long um, that is getting me ready for ordination and licensing for the CMNA. And during this time, I have learned so much. I have grown in Christ. I have just, when I picked this book up, the words have become alive to me. Before, they were words on a page that I would try to struggle to get through. But today, these words are active and alive in my life. And I owe that to the people that God has placed in my life who's seen something in me when I didn't see that in myself. Pastor Eddie, many of you might know Pastor Eddie who was here. He encouraged me to go through the lead program. I am now at the end, and I have a couple months left to, be, to, to graduate and complete. And I know Pastor Bruce might have mentioned this, but um, I had had uh, trouble because I'm going on a mission trip to France in November, and I had really trouble getting my passport. Um, one, one issue after another, whatever it may be. I applied back in February. Well, I had till Wednesday of last week to get it, to be able to go on this trip. And praise God, He is so good. Because I got it four days before my cutoff that I had to have it. And I give glory all to God for that because I kept, during this time, yeah, I'm human. I was getting a little worried and frustrated that I didn't get my passport and I got to go to this to be able to complete my graduation. And then finally I was like, you know what, God, I'm giving this to you. If it is your will for me to go, no man on the face of this earth is going to shut that door. Yeah. 
Nobody is going to hold that back from me getting it. And God came through like He always does, right? He came through. I got my passport. And I also want to give thanks to all of those who donated and invested in me to be able to go to this trip to France. You know, people might think, well, France is just, you know, it's a luxury vacation place. Well, I'm not get to go to Paris and the Eiffel Tower with my wife and this and that. I get to go over there and preach the gospel and tell people about Jesus. And people are like, well, France isn't a third world country. Exactly. That's why I want to go there. Because third world countries, they're going to be easily accepting. They're going to accept Jesus a lot easier because they're, they need hope. They have nothing. They're desperate. France is going to be a challenge because I'm going over there to a country that is like us. They're not desperate. They're not hurting for food and water and if it's Savior. They put their Savior in, in the healing. And 80% of that country are not Christians. That is a staggering number to me. So I get to go over there for 10 days and come alongside the Christian and Missionary Alliance and vision site of missionaries that are already over there and go through and just speak Jesus over that country and to speak Jesus into the lives of people that don't know him. And I feel like God has not just given me a calling to do that, but God has a plan and a purpose for my life today to one day become a lead pastor in a church. Now, I don't know what that looks like yet. I know God already knows. If it's here, amen. amen. If it's somewhere else, I'll go. Because I must listen to what my Lord King Jesus says to me. Because if I'm not listening to Him, then I'm listening to things of this world. And I searched things of this world for 40 years of my life and failed time after time after time. So today's message... I want to uh, talk about the priorities of kingdom living. Now, I'm going to try to work this slide gimmick thing that Pastor Bruce does and hope it all works. It should. Um, I'm going to talk about priorities in kingdom living. Um, you know, the more we understand the kingdom living authority under the authority of King Jesus, the more we begin to realize the power that is available to us to live a life pleasing un to the king. Some of us have so many priorities in life that we struggle with, right? What if um, hypothetically in the middle of the night your house caught on fire and you had to evacuate quickly and could only save one item? What would that one item be? Someone said who? What? Okay. Amen. What is that one thing you cannot live without? What if you were stranded on an island in the middle of the ocean? What is that one thing that you would miss out on? What is more precious to you than life itself? Everybody has priorities, but often those priorities are not obvious and are clouded by non-essential items. Most of our time we spend doing things that are essential and we go to places that are not necessary. Many seem to be just caught up in the rat race of life. This just might be why this generation has been the most medicated generation ever. If we could begin to eliminate from our lives the non-essentials, we might rediscover the priorities of our lives that truly define who we are. Most people allow non-essential things in life to define them, which, is, which only brings out them being burnt out. Even in ministry, we can get so caught up in doing things that are really necessary, that are not really necessary, and are not kingdom-minded and kingdom work. When it comes to spiritual things, it does not seem to be different for us. We as Christians are so cluttered with non-essentials that we have really lost the priority in our lives. And remember, priority is singular. That means there can only be one priority in our life. So what is it and how have you defined it? So this morning as we examine the parables of Jesus, we're going to be in Luke chapter 6. Um, we're going to be covering verse 39 all the way to 49. Um, we're going to see the priorities as Jesus established them to be in our life. These are his priorities that he calls us for our life. 
You know, a parable contains the truth that the Holy Spirit can reveal, that only the Holy Spirit can reveal. This truth has to do with kingdom living. On the surface of a parable, there may be some truth applicable to general living. The real purpose of the parable is to reveal truth dealing with the kingdom. So let's dive in this morning and let me explain what I mean by kingdom living. Kingdom living is a life lived under the authority of a king. Accordingly, the king has absolute authority. His commands are not for our consideration, but for our obedience. For us, that king is Jesus. We sung it in that song right there, John. Thank you for playing that worship team. Thank you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I lay my life down at the foot of Jesus because it's all about Jesus. We are living under his authority and guidance, and we are brought into harmony with priorities of his kingdom. Many today do not realize that Christianity is not a democracy. It is a theocracy. The more we understand kingdom living under the authority of Jesus, we will begin to realize the power that is available to us to live a life pleasing unto the king. To know more about this kingdom living, first, though, I needed to know more about the king. Because the kingdom is defined by the king. Practical application of kingdom living is seen in the fact that the closer we get to King Jesus, the more abhorrent sin and evil become. The closer we get to Jesus, the more uncomfortable we are with the world. Because if I'm comfortable with sin, the world, and the evil in the world, then there is a definable distance between Jesus and myself. Many call themselves Christians, but are not living under the authority of Christ. They come on Sunday to worship and praise God, and then go out Monday through Saturday living how they want to live. You see, I could say that because that was me in my walk with Christ when I first came to Christ. I thought if I just showed up on Sunday morning for an hour, praise God, got my worship on, that I was pleasing the king, that I was living under kingdom authority. But see, I would go out Monday, my gas tank would be real full from getting spiritually fed on Sunday. By Tuesday, that gas tank's getting real empty. By Wednesday, I'm running under half a tank. Thursday, Friday, I'm running on E. Saturday, I don't even got fumes left in the tank. Because I was only pleasing God one day out of the week. When I realized and I came into my Christian walk, being mentored by many people, men of God, who know Scripture, who have taught me, who have came alongside of me and showed me what it truly is to please King Jesus. It's not just coming here on Sunday morning for an hour, hour and a half. It's pleasing Him seven days a week, 24 hours a day in everything we do. So listen to what Jesus said about this in Matthew. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. I can't even read that. Not from here. I used to be able to read that. <laughs> Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Mm. Mm. Here Jesus is clearly warning us about those who claim to be followers of him, but do not truly live according to his teachings. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus emphasizes that it is not just our confession of faith that grants us entry into heaven but also genuine obedience and submission to God's will. Jesus condemns those who outwardly profess faith in him, but lead hypocritical lives. In verse 22, he says, he, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, perform many miracles? These individuals Jesus speaks of 
have engaged in religious activities and performed mighty works. But here's the key, and I don't want you to miss this. Their hearts were not truly devoted to God. Their actions were driven by selfish motives rather than a genuine love for Him. Jesus emphasizes the importance of obeying God's commands and living a righteous life. We see it in verse 23. He declares, Then I will let them, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers, workers of lawlessness. Oh, church, hear me right now. Make sure your heart is right with God because that is not what you want to hear on the day of judgment, is that I never knew you. I pray that all of you have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. It's not just about knowing Jesus. The devil knows Jesus. It's about having an intimate relationship and connection with King Jesus. Simple. There's no other way to put it. Those who persistently live in obedience and agree in unrepentant sin will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. True faith in Jesus is marked by transformed lives that seek to follow His teachings and live accordingly to God's standards. You know, here we pride ourselves on, Pastor Bruce does, is making prayer happen. Yes, that is the number one pillar of New Hope Community Church that we pray and we make prayer happen. But I want to start seeing lives transformed because if you're coming to church for 10, 15, 20 years and your life hasn't changed, then you need to do a check heart. You need to get right with God because it's all about transforming us, changing our heart to who we are. I'm not the same Joe I was six years ago. People that knew me then do not know me now. Who is that guy? Because I have had a transformation. I've taken all the information and it has become transformation. And that is how we are called to live, a transformed life. Jesus highlights the importance of deep personal relationship with him. The reason he says he never knew you in verse 23 is indicating that these individuals lack that intimate connection with him. True followers of Jesus are known by their personal relationship with him, characterized by love, obedience, and a desire to know him more intimately. Simple as that. Now, if you do have your Bibles, we're going to go right into Luke right now. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 39. Um, the parable that Jesus gives here has to do with the priorities in kingdom living. The basic theme has to do with our relationship with others. What the parable is trying to teach us is that our relationship with others in the world around us clearly reflects our relationship with God. This truth equips us with the power to affect the world around us in kingdom authority. You know, the kingdom authority in, in this scripture that we're going to go through today has, um, like I like to call, three authority at kingdom authority aspects. Um, the first aspect, and it's in the worship folder if you want to um, follow along. Pastor Bruce has me do this and, you know, leave out some words and let you guys fill it in. First aspect of kingdom authority. The basis of kingdom authority is discipleship. Discipleship. But before we break down these verses in Luke, I want to go to Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. And that's what I love about the Christian and Missionary Alliance. It's not about keeping their best right here. It's about sending their best out there to go preach the gospel to all nations, to the ends of the earth, wherever it may be. You know, that is uh, the Great Commission right there, is that we go out to all nations. The key to discipleship we see in verse 40 
is the reality of life is that you are becoming like your teacher. The question is, who is your teacher? Who are you following? To answer that, you need to look at what direction you're going in. Jesus will be leading you away from the world if you are going in that direction. But if you're going in the right direction, then your teacher is Jesus. If, however, you are going in the direction of the world, then Jesus is not your teacher. You are not following Him. Jesus will not lead you into the world because the world is under judgment. If you are chasing the world, then you are running from Jesus. So let's make sure you're following the right teacher and leaders who will show you more about the kingdom living in faith and whose guidance you can trust. This is where I give all glory to God for my life, what it is today, is I stopped following things of the world and I started following teachers and leaders who are in Christ Jesus, who took me along, helped me through whatever I was going through, Help me understand stuff in the Bible that I was just looking at and didn't understand. And I praise God that He placed these people in my life. Because from the beginning, before I was put in my mother's womb, He had a plan and a purpose for me, just like He does each and every one of you. One of the obligations of discipleship is ministering to a brother or sister in the Lord. There is a way to do it, and there is a way not to do it. This parable is clearly disclosing to us the power, proper way of ministering to brothers and sisters in Christ. Many have lifted these words, words out of context to make them say something together totally different. For example, look at Luke verse 37. Most people will focus on the first phrase, judge not and you will not be judged. Of course people use this to justify a life of sin and rebellion. It is not saying anything of the sort. Notice what Jesus says in this parable. Jesus doesn't mean we should ignore wrongdoing, but we should not be so worried about other sins that we overlook our own. We often rationalize our sins by pointing out the same mistakes in others. What kind of specks in others' eyes are easiest for you to criticize? Remember, your own planks when you feel like criticizing, and you may just see that you have less to say. First, we need to take care of our personal lives and our relationship to the Lord first. We need to make sure we are living in complete obedience to the kingdom authority. Then, once we have taken care of our own relationship, we are in a position and have an obligation to minister to a brother or sister. The dynamics of Christian discipleship include the community of Christians. The most precious thing we have on this side of heaven is our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? So how are we treating them? We're going to move to the second aspect, which is the evidence of kingdom authority is fruit. You know, we see this in verses 43 through 45. And I'll try to read that again, but I got to step over here. So 43 through 45 says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. What we say in life, our actions, define on who we are. You know, and like John said when he was up here, that you know, sometimes, I, just like me, I have to really watch my temper and mouth when I'm on 41 here in Northport. <laughs> like... It is very hard not to get upset with the way people drive. But you know what somebody once told me? And it really started helping me, but I'm not perfect. I still sometimes get angry. You can ask my son and wife. They're... Is the next time somebody pulls out in front of you, Joe, or is going, needs to get somewhere faster than you, or just going too slow, just remind yourself, tell yourself 
that maybe that person has a loved one in the hospital that they are rushing to get to. That's why they cut you off because they had to get somewhere faster than you did. Maybe that person's wife is in labor and he is rushing to the hospital to witness the birth of his firstborn child. I started telling myself that anytime people cut me off. And I was like, okay, what do I do when people get in front of me and are going so slow and not doing anything? They're not in a rush to get anywhere. And I am. Just pray, Joe. Just pray. Give it to God and just pray. So I tried doing that and it does help. So any of you who are struggling out here and driving on 41, people that cut you off or go fast, think that. They're going slow, just pray. That's all I can tell you. You know? <clears throat> so as we see this in verse 43 and 45, many people say they are Christians, and yet in their life there is no evidence to back up that claim. In fact, the whole tenure of their life says they are anything but Christians. Ask yourself this. If you were arrested for being a Christian today, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I hope we all say yes. Somebody once said that they're not supposed to judge one another, and yes, that's true. We are not supposed to judge each other. But we are supposed to be fruit inspectors to see if it is good or bad, right? When you go to the grocery store and you pick up some, some fruit, don't you check the fruit to see if it's good, if it's going to last a while? Yeah. It's the same thing we should do with the people that we try to hang out with and, and be in um, conversation with. We are called to be fruit inspectors. The question that bears upon my heart today is simply this. Am I bearing the fruit of living under kingdom authority? And I pray that is a question for you as well today. Are you bearing good fruit? It is impossible to be a born-again believer in Christ Jesus, living under the kingdom authority, and not bear fruit. And if I'm not, if I'm not something is wrong somewhere. Either God's word is not true, or something is wrong with my life. And today I stand on the promises of His words to be true. So I might need to do a heart check if something is wrong and I'm not bearing any fruit. Notice how emphatic Jesus says this. As far as he was concerned, and his concerns should be our concerns, the fruit of your life produces the evidence of your life. Are you comfortable in the world? Do you come to church on Sunday, but the rest of the week enjoy all the worldly pleasures? Oh, I did. I enjoyed the worldly pleasures. But you know what? Nothing could fulfill me like the love of Jesus Christ could. I never had the fulfillment of love, acceptance, than I do for my Father. Because I chased this worldly pleasures for 40 years of my life, and it never got me nowhere but hurt. What Jesus is saying here is you cannot have it both ways. You are either one or the other. The world can offer you a lot of enjoyment, but it can, only, it can never offer you fulfillment. Only the love of Jesus can offer you fulfillment. Amen? The fruit in your life reveals the reality of re your relationship with Jesus Christ. And he reminds us that our speech and actions reveal our true underlying beliefs, attitudes, and motivations. The good impressions we try to to make cannot last if we are being deceptive. Our heart reveals itself in our speech, our behavior, just as Jesus says in verse 45, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. What treasures in your heart today? Is it anger? Is it bitterment? Is it resentment? Because when those treasures are what's in your heart, then you are not going to be able to speak how Jesus wants you to speak. You have so much anger, resentment built up inside. The body, the heart can only take so much before we explode, right? So what treasures are in your heart today? Go home this afternoon, do a heart check and ask God, God, if there's anything in my heart that is not of you, remove it in the name of Jesus right now. And he will remove it. He doesn't want you walking around this world bitter, angry, confused, 
that spirit of confusion that's going around this world today that nobody knows what's going on, it is real. It's demonic. It is a spirit of confusion. Our third and final aspect of the foundation of kingdom authority is obedience. Obedience. We see this in verse 46 through 49 where Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord and do not and do not what I tell you? For everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who builds a house on the ground without foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. So what foundation have you built your life upon today? Have you built your house on the solid rock of Jesus Christ? Or have you built your house on sinking sand? You know, Jesus asks that very important question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you? It's one thing to give lip service to the Lord, but it's another thing to have your life in harmony with His Word. One thing that brings His Word into harmony with our life is our obedience to that Word. Examine your heart. What Word... Are you obeying today? This past week, what word did you obey? The pursuit of our daily walk with Jesus is fueled by obeying His word. Obeying God is not a burden because the core of our obedience is His love for us and our love for Him. The very delight of my life is obeying the Lord. Daily, I look for ways to obey Him because in that obedience, I know that I am pleasing Him. God bless you. Now, as we look at these last two verses in this message about building a solid foundation, we might be asking ourselves, why would anybody build on a rock that is solid, that is not solid? Why would not anybody build on a rock that is solid? Well, perhaps just to save time, to avoid hard work of preparation for that rock, or perhaps because they want to join their friends who have already settled in sandy areas. And I believe that is one of the most, probably the reasons for this, is people get with other people who have settled in sinking sand instead of getting with people who have built their life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Maybe, or maybe they haven't even heard about the violent storms that are coming. That could be possible because they have discounted the reports or because they think disaster can't happen to them. Whatever their reasons are, those with no foundation are short-sighted and they will be sorry. Obeying God's word is like building a house on a strong, solid foundation that stands firm when the storms of life come. Because you can guarantee the storms of life are coming. They don't stop. When we become Christians, we give our life to Jesus, some people say, oh, my life got so much easier. No, mine has gotten harder. Because it's a constant battle with the world every day. Sometimes ministry can be exhausting. But most of the time, ministry is exciting. And I say exciting because it's like igniting that fire within me that I know that I'm going out fighting giants in this world. Celebrate Recovery is a very, very hard ministry that I just decided, me and my wife decided, just, just dive head first in it and let's just get it on. Well, thank you. It's all because of God. So, obeying God's word is simply building a house on solid foundation which stands firm, firm when the storms come. When life is calm, our foundations really don't even seem to matter, right? But when crisis comes, when the storms come and rains hit your house, your house will fall. Your house cannot withstand 
the storms of life, and I'm not talking about hurricanes. I'm talking about relationships, addictions, family troubles. You name it, the list goes on. We all have troubles in life, right? All of us. And I promise you, if your house is not built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, your house will fall when crisis, trials, and tribulations come upon your life. Because I know, I didn't have my life, I was beyond the sinking sand. And every time trials and storms came in crisis, I failed. I fell and couldn't get up. Now that I have my life built on the rock of Jesus Christ and a solid foundation, I have so many brothers in my life that are like family to me today. That come along, and that's what building the rock is. It's, it's about having Jesus in your life, but it's about having brothers and sisters who are in Christ with you to go through this world together, like I said in the beginning of this message. We are not meant to do this alone. So build your life on the solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ and with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Amen. So in conclusion to this message this morning, the good, good fruit in our lives confirms our discipleship, and that fruit is a result of obeying God's Word. Understanding our position in God's kingdom enables us to understand the power and authority we have throughout our lives in this troubled world. This is how we overcome the obstacles in our daily life. Amen. Praise God. He is good. You know, I love being able to um, preach when I get the opportunity to. So I always tell Bruce, try to go out of town as much as he can. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I love Pastor Bruce. He, is, uh, he has been a blessing to this church. He has been a blessing to me. And I'm sure he's been a blessing to so many others. So, uh, John, you got a closing song. Um, something I love to do, and I do it every week at CR, is during this last song that we always play, I always want it to be an altar call because I feel like it is important that we fight our battles on our knees, that we have somebody laying a hand on us and praying for us. So the altar is open. If there's anything you need prayer for, please come up to the altar. Do not be ashamed. Do not feel like you're a burden. I want to pray for you. I want God to release his power and authority for you to live a kingdom life today. And if there's anything that you're struggling with, leave it at the feet of Jesus. He cries out for our burdens. He cries out for our pain. Problem is, we don't want to give it to him. So will you give Jesus today something that you're holding on to, whatever stronghold it is, whatever God is not doing in your life today and you want him to? You have to give it to him. You have to release it to him. So the altar is going to be open for anybody who would like to come up for prayer. I encourage you to please do so. God bless you guys and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.